Right, hello there. So you have clicked on this video to find out a little bit about the Conflict and Tension Unit 1 peacekeeping subunit within the Conflict and Tension topic as part of the AQA GCSE course. This video is going to recap some of the main events that took place during the period after the First World War, including the Paris Peace Conference and the outcome of that leading into the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. So that's what we're going to be covering during this video uh, today. So let's get started. I'm going to start off by recapping who these individuals were who made up the big three at the Paris Peace Conference. Starting off with this man on the left hand side, we've got David Lloyd George, who was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the end of the First World War. And then next, we're going to talk about Georges Clemenceau, who was the French uh, Prime Minister at the end of the First World War. And then we're going to refer to Woodrow Wilson, who was the US President. So to start with, David Lloyd George, he wanted to punish Germany during the Paris Peace Conference and in the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. He wanted to punish them publicly because he was aware of the fact that the British public had a sense of resentment towards Germany in the First World War, the fact that many British men had died between 1914 and 1918 which led to the public wanting revenge and retribution towards Germany. However, Lloyd George was slightly caught in the middle of what the public wanted and what was sort of best really economically for Britain, in the sense that Germany was one of Britain's largest trading partners. So he had to juggle the public's expectation with what he actually knew would be best for Britain and the UK economically. He also didn't want to punish Germany too harshly because he knew that weakening Germany sufficiently as a result of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles would potentially allow the conditions for communism, which was a growing threat after the Russian Revolution in 1917 in Eastern Europe, to spread from Eastern Europe to Germany. So he didn't want to allow communism to gain a foothold in Germany essentially after the First World War. Then we've got George Clemenceau. Now, like the British public, the French public were very angry at what had happened to French men during the First World War and large sections of French society, and also the damage that had been inflicted on France in large parts of eastern France. And therefore, the French people wanted Clemenceau to punish Germany harshly. And Clemenceau was concerned that Germany might try and invade France again in the future. So he basically wanted to impose really harsh terms onto Germany. He didn't want Germany to have an army at all. He wanted Alsace-Lorraine, which was a region that bordered France and Germany, to be returned to France again. And he wanted to impose crippling reparations, which are payments that were paid back to the winning countries at the end of the First World War to be paid to France. So he wanted very harsh terms imposed onto Germany. And finally, we've got Woodrow Wilson. And he, you could argue, wanted the most lenient terms placed on Germany as America only joined the war in 1917. And he was concerned that by punishing Germany too harshly, it would result in a repeat of the First World War again. So he had the most sort of lenient attitude towards Germany. He felt that like I said, by punishing Germany too harshly, it would result in a repeat of the First World War again, which was sort of at odds with what Clemenceau and to a lesser extent what Lloyd George wanted to do to Germany. As part of Woodrow Wilson's beliefs about how the world should look after the First World War, he put together a series of 14 points to try and ensure that there would be no repeat of a, of a world war again. And Part of these points, or some of these points included ideas such as no more secret treaties between countries, which it was argued had been a factor in causing the First World War. The fact that European empires should be reduced in size. Wilson wasn't really a fan of, of empires and countries having empires at all in the early 20th century. He did, however, believe that uh, Alsace-Lorraine should be given back to France. So there was a bit of a crossover there between what Clemenceau wanted and what 
Wilson wanted at the end of the first war. But probably the most important point for Wilson was this last point at the bottom here, which mentions about an association of nations. Essentially, this is the League of Nations that was created in January 1920. And you'll come to look at the League of Nations in more detail in future revision lessons uh, and in topic two of the Conflict and Tension Unit in terms of the failures and successes of the League of Nations, why ultimately it failed in preventing another war from breaking out. So Woodrow Wilson, it was his idea to create the League of Nations, although you'll see again, like I mentioned, when you come to look at the League of Nations in more detail, that the USA actually never joined the League of Nations, which was quite a controversial, controversial factor in why some people believe that the League of Nations ultimately end up failing. So here are some of these key terms then of the Treaty of Versailles, which was signed on the 28th of June 1919. And essentially it was it consisted of 440 articles setting out the terms for Germany's punishment. And the treaty was, was almost sort of universally hated and disliked by German people after it was imposed on them. Germany didn't have a say in the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which was a source of real resentment and bitterment amongst the German people. So here are some of the main terms then. Firstly, the League of Nations being created in January 1920. However, Germany was not allowed to join that. So we've got that one at the top here. We've got the Rhineland was demilitarized, which meant that German soldiers weren't allowed in that region of Germany, which was in the west of Germany. German soldiers and army wasn't al weren't allowed there. Alsace-Lorraine was indeed returned to France. Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria. So that was known as Anschluss. Now, many Germans and some Austrians wanted Germany and Austria to unite together. However, that was forbidden as part of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany lost over 10% of its land. Some of this was given not only to France, but also to Poland. And it created what was known as the Polish Corridor between Germany and East Prussia. So Germany did keep some land the other side or to the east of the, sorry, the, yes, the east of um, the Polish corridor. However, it did also lose a, a strip of land that separated Prussia um, or East Prussia with the rest of Germany. In that strip of land, known as the Polish corridor, a city called Danzig became under the control of the League of Nations, or came under the control of the League of Nations. All German colonies, Germany didn't have a massive empire before the First World War, but the colonies that did compose its empire were given to Britain and France's mandates, which were essentially uh, colonies. The German army was only allowed to be 100,000 men. Okay, Bear in mind that during the First World War, the German army had composed of millions of men, so many men now felt felt themselves or put, had been made unemployed as a result of this reduction in the size of the German army. Germany wasn't allowed to have an air force, its navy was restricted to six battleships and no submarines. So again, a very small number of ships and submarines in comparison to other world powers at the time, especially countries like Britain. Germany, and it could be argued, some historians argue this is the most important term, placed on Germany at the end of the First World War, Germany was made to accept responsibility and war guilt for causing the First World War, which some historians argue was the most important term because it allowed the winning countries to impose really harsh terms onto Germany. Had Germany not admitted fault for causing the First World War, it might have been more difficult for the winning countries to justify why they placed these really harsh terms onto Germany at the end of the First World War. And Germany would have to pay reparations. Now, you can use either this term of 132 billion. Don't forget reparations, like we mentioned already, are payments made to winning countries at the end of, the war, of a war. And Germany was made to pay 132 billion gold marks. Or you can also say 6.6 .6 billion pounds, whichever is easier for you to remember in your assessment. So Germany was made to pay 132 billion gold marks or 6.6 .6 billion pounds. Now, as we mentioned already, the German people pretty much hated everything about the Treaty of Versailles. They were angry about the fact that 
Germany hadn't been allowed to negotiate the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, and they refer to this as a diktat or dictated peace. We've mentioned already Germany was made to be responsible for the war starting and were made to agree to the war guilt clause. Um, and this was a, a sense of real sort of embitterment amongst the German people because they felt that it allowed the winning countries to impose whatever sanctions they wanted onto Germany. There was a revolution against the treaty in Berlin in 1920, the Kapp Putsch. If you're studying Germany from 1890 to 1945, this will come up again in that unit in more detail. So there's a bit of an overlap here between the conflict and tension unit and the Germany unit. But like we said, Germany had to pay back 6.6 .6 billion pounds in terms of reparations. They, they couldn't pay them, so they defaulted in 1923. And eventually when Hitler came to power, in the 1930s, he refused to pay them altogether. And the Weimar government was associated with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles and Germany's failure in the First World War. Many of the politicians, it was claimed, had stabbed Germany, the German army in the back, and this became known as the stab in the back myth. And it was a real source of resentment from many German, especially nationalistic, very, very patriotic Germans towards the Weimar government during its existence. Here we've got some of the, the terms that have been organised as part of a mnemonic of gargle. Okay, so we've got guilt, Germany made to be responsible for starting the First World War. Then we've got the army or the military being reduced in size, the army to 100,000, the air force, there wasn't an air force allowed, and only six battleships and 15,000 sailors in the Navy. 6.6 .6 billion had to be repaid to the winning countries in the storm until 1984 when it was first set, although this did change in the 1920s when the German Foreign Minister Streisman did manage to, to amend and change some of the reparation payments. Germany lost land, colonies were given to the winning countries like France and Britain as mandates, uh, Alsace-Lorraine was given back to France. Germany was banned from joining the League of Nations, at least up until 1926 when Streisman managed to convince the League of Nations to allow Germany to join. and Another term of the Treaty of Versailles was that Germany and Austria weren't allowed to unite or join together as part of Anschluss. Now we'll just quickly talk over some of the other treaties that were imposed on Germany's allies because this is actually part of the specification for the Conflict and Tension Unit that you're aware of the other treaties that were imposed on Germany's allies. So we're just going to go through three of them now. So the Treaty of Saint-Germain, which was enforced on Austria on the 10th of September 1919. Its army was limited to 30,000 volunteers, so they couldn't be conscripted or made to join the army. Austria did not pay much in reparations as the economy was so weak, and actually the League of Nations tried to give some help to Austria in 1921 to, to try and uh, give it advice about how to strengthen its economy. But it didn't actually end up paying back any reparations, unlike Germany. But Austria did lose so much land. In fact, it lost so much land that its population fell from 22 million to around 6 million. And there's some examples just above that about the sorts of, of places um, that Austria lost land to. So lost land to countries like Italy, uh, Bosnia, Czechoslovakia, Poland and Romania. Then we've got the Treaty of Trianon on the 4th of June 1920. It basically, similarly to the treaty imposed on Austria, the Hungarian army was limited to 35,000 volunteers and only three patrol boats. Reparations, uh, apart from some shipments, coal, Austria could, uh, Hungary sorry, could not meet the demands for reparations. As a result, the payments were suspended. So a little bit like Austria, the repayments weren't strictly enforced. And the Austro-Hungarian empire was dismantled. Land was lost, similarly like Austria to Yugoslavia and Romania, and the population fell from you know, around 21, 22 million to just seven and a half million. So almost a third of the original size of, uh, of Austria-Hungary there. And then we've got the Treaty of Several, which was enforced onto Turkey, as it was now known, although during the First World War, it was known as the Ottoman Empire, which was, which was signed on the 10th of August, 1920. And this led to, Turkey being allowed 50,000 soldiers but no air force. Now 
a slightly different situation here with Turkey in the sense that the economy was controlled by the Allies. Parts of Turkey, large swathes of Turkey, were controlled by Britain, France and uh, Italy at the end of the First World War. So there was there was actually a sort of takeover and control of Turkey by Britain, France and Italy uh, once it had lost the war. Now, areas such as Iraq and Palestine, so areas outside of Turkey that used to be part of the Ottoman Empire became parts of uh, Britain and France, like Syria, Iraq, Palestine. They now became parts of or they became parts of the French and British empires. And Armenia became an independent country. There had been a long standing conflict between Armenia and or the Armenian people and the Ottoman Empire um, sort of during the early parts of the 20th century. And um, there's quite a controversial part of history at the moment, which where some historians in some countries believe that there was a genocide committed by the Ottoman Empire against Armenia, but many Turks don't feel that there was a genocide that took place. So con quite a controversial area there. Now, the Treaty of Sevres actually lasted only three years. Um, because nationalists in Turkey were unhappy about the terms of the Treaty of Sevres and the fact that Turkey was being occupied by the winning countries in the First World War, which led to uh, a, a rebellion, a revolt amongst Turkish nationalists. And the Treaty of Sevres was actually replaced in 1923 by the Treaty of Lausanne, um, which is a place in Switzerland, and the terms were much more lenient and the foreign occupiers of Turkey had to leave the country. So it just shows that uh, it showed that if countries protested and rebelled enough against the terms of a treaty, they could actually be overturned. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for listening and I hope it helped.